be here to moderate any questions that come up. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Brown. I think everyone knows he's the person who everyone emails whenever there's a question about anything involving hormones, whether they're thyroid, diabetes, or um, gender affirming. Um, and we're so thankful to have you here today. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Eileen. Um, so I'll be talking about a little about statins, um, very hot topic these days. Um, and you'll see a lot of my slides um, were given to me by Steve Grinspoon, uh, who gave a IAS talk um, uh, in Australia this summer on the main results. Um, so the study that Ripri was just studied, uh, just published in the, uh, the New England Journal uh, last month. And uh, so we'll be going over those results. I want to give a little background first about statins and HIV um, and, talk, and about cardiovascular disease in general. This uh, study comes from Mass General. Um, and Steve Grimsmo was a, the first author. Gene Trian was the, the, uh, the uh, Steve was the senior author. Gene was the, the first author looking at the partners cohort. And one of the first to really show how different the risk of myocardial infarction is in people with HIV. And you can see in the, in the diamonds here, the um, events in people without HIV in this very large um, healthcare system in Boston. And in the uh, gray line here, the people with HIV. And importantly, um, pretty much at every age, um, the risk is higher in people with HIV versus not. And importantly, too, the, um, the, the difference between people with and without HIV increases with increasing age. Uh, so a really important age interaction there. And we know that um, there are many risk factors that are involved in cardiovascular disease uh, in people with HIV. The green ones here are um, non-modifiable risk factors. Here are the traditional risk factors that are generally modifiable. And then in yellow are the, um, the things that are specific to HIV, uh, particularly um, some antiretroviral therapies. Fortunately, not so much uh, anymore in terms of the, you know, the th therapies have gotten better, include their, uh, as far as their lipid effects uh, and potentially direct effects. Um, but the impact of uh, chronic HIV and systemic inflammation uh, on, on cardiovascular disease and other comorbidities as well uh, is still a very, is very relevant issue. Um, so lipid, looking at lipids in particular, and I just wanted to uh, draw your attention to this study that Carrie Altoff presented at Croy in 17 was published in, Lan in Lancet HIV. But um, here, looking at NA Accord, at the population attributable risk uh, uh, fraction. So these are, you know, of, of various risk factors involved in uh, MI, trying to look to see if you were to eliminate these risk factors, how much risk would you eliminate? And not surprisingly, the, the, big, um, the big players here are traditional risk factors. And so smoking, cholesterol, hypertension, Diabetes less so, which is interesting, and then things that that um, may be important here, like like uh, that are specific to HIV, um, less so. So the low CD4 cell count, uh, detectable viremia, uh, hepatitis C, uh, uh, um, still players, but less so than the than the big traditional risk factors. So this is a case actually uh, that I presented, same case um, back in 2018, I gave a talk to, um, to uh, for the uh, big CME about lipids. Um, so this is the case that I presented just to, to go through some of the risk equations, then you know we, we can interpret the reprieve results uh, uh, in context. And so this is a person so on clinic, 55 year old African-American male, long history of, of HIV, on, you know, you can see it's a little dated um, uh, uh, on uh, uh, boosted integrase inhibitor with l um, history of seven years PI, 10, NRTI um, for 10 years and uh, more than 10 years. And I'll show you why I, I put that in. Um, no real risk factor, other risk factors, um, traditional risk factors besides uh, smoking. So he's uh, stopped smoking recently, good blood pressure, and here you see his lipids. So total cholesterol 288, triglycerides 242, HDL 69, LDL uh, 171. So the question is, you know, should this 
person be put on a statin, you know, for primary prevention. So if you, if you look at the guidelines, um, this is the ACCHA guidelines. So people who should get a statin. So people with known uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So he doesn't have that. Individuals with an LDL greater than or equal to 190. He doesn't have that. The uh, individuals um, uh, with diabetes who are between 70 and, and 189, uh, does not diabetic. And uh, for this, this would be the criteria that would potentially apply to him. So individuals 40 to 75 with an estimated 10 year risk of 7.5 or greater. So um, when we think about risk uh, uh, estimation, there are a bunch of different risk calculators that are available in the general, general population. You're all, I'm sure, familiar with Framingham risk score, the sort of improvement on the Framingham risk score, the pool cohort equation, which includes not only um, the Framingham cohort, but the other cohorts, um, hence the name, uh, including MESA. So you, you really get the, um, uh, it's a multi-ethnic, um, uh, um, risk score, so, you, so some additional risk factors enter in. The DAD risk score, which you might not be familiar with, um, which is um, in the DAD cohort, specifically you know, HIV focused. Um, Reynolds risk score, which is like Framingham, but adds in CRP, um, which isn't used very much. So here you see the, the factors that go into the Framingham risk score. Um, and you, I'm sure you've used this, this risk score in the past, giving you a 10 year risk of coronary artery disease. Um, the advantage for the pool cohort equation, besides it's you know, the, the underlying data, which is multi-ethnic, um, is that it not only looks at, at uh, heart attack, but stroke. Um, so that's, that's an important uh, uh, difference. And so here you see the variables that, that are, are put in here. Um, and then just for um, uh, comparison, this is the DAD risk equation. It's instead of a 10-year risk horizon, it's a five-year risk horizon. And so very similar risk factors that you, you put in the, the DAD equation with a few differences. And um, one is a back of ear, yes, no. Um, so, you know, as we all know, there's this question about a back of ear um, and, and myocardial infarction, years of PI exposure, years of NRTI exposure, CD4 cell count. So all those things are, of course, specific to HIV infection, um, uh, which may improve the, the fit. So thinking about how these equations compare, looking at the, the um, group, the, the guy that I presented, so his Framingham risk is 10%. So this is without smoking. So if you give him smoking, which um, you know, he, he uh, did have at one point, that'd be 20%. So he'd be high risk, but 10% 10, 10 if he was, he would be in the moderate risk pool for Framingham. For pool cohort, 6.6%. And for the DAD, 6.39%. Um, uh, and so you can see the risk stratification that are um, you know, part of these equations. So the, one of the important things and the, and the backdrop here is that these equations, you know, not DAD, but the other equations that were um, created in the general population actually don't work very well in people with HIV. So this is a, a nice paper by Gene Triant looking at, at the partner's cohort again, and looking the, the um, blue is the predicted risk of myocardial infarction in people with incident myocardial, or incident events, I should say, because it does look at MI and stroke, um, in people with, uh, with HIV at various um, uh, strata for the, um, the pool cohort equation. And you know, that's, in, that's the, the predicted based on their risk. And, but in red, here you see what actually the observed risk of, of incident events were. And you can see pretty much at every risk, the, the red bar is higher than the blue bar. So there really is quite an underestimation of risk in uh, people with HIV um, using these equations. Um, and so this gets at this I, um, gets at this idea of what I showed you Gene's earlier study, looking at the increased risk of myocardial infarction. And that's of course adjusted for traditional uh, risk factors that I showed you in the very first slide. 
So um, as a result of these and other studies, um, the, um, in the 2019 uh, guidelines for primary prevention, a, a bunch of di you know, different risk enhancing factors were identified. And so you can see them here, things that aren't accounted for in the pooled cohort equation, but um, would be a risk enhancer. So things like um, you know, uh, uh, primary hypercholesterolemia, uh, family history, metabolic syndrome, chronic kidney disease, and then you can see this bottom line over here in the bottom right, uh, HIV or AIDS. Um, and this sort of was informed by uh, a um, panel that um, uh, the senior author of, of which was our own Wendy Post, um, looking specifically at you know, giving recommendations for people with HIV. Um, and, um, and I'll just, you, you probably have seen this document. It's, it's a very nicely written document, great summary of the literature. Um, this is sort of tough to see, um, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of, of what, you know, this is the, a main, you know, algorithm, treatment algorithm, looking at uh, assessing risk. And um, in addition to, you know, HIV being a risk enhancer, there are within people with HIV, there are additional risk enhancers. Um, and so uh, they identify people with um, a long history of HIV viremia, uh, or delay in start of art initiation, low current or nadir CD4 cell count, um, treatment failure or non-adherence with HIV, metabolic syndrome, lipodystrophy or fatty liver disease, hep C co-infection. So these are the people in whom this risk is, is in, in people with HIV is even more enhanced. Um, and so they recommend recommended, um, you know, uh, having this be even a, a, an increased risk enhancer and perhaps, you know, whatever value you get out of the pool cohort equation, perhaps you should double that when you, when you think about um, assessing their risk. So um, this, you know, I, I highlight this because this is, you know, so they're foreshadowing what was to come, which was the reprieve study. So this, this is right from the introduction of this, of this statement and says, you know, the purpose of this document is to provide a thorough review um, of existing evidence on HIV associated uh, cardiovascular disease, as well as pragmatic recommendations of how to approach CVD uh, prevention. So that's what I just showed you. Uh, and treatment in the absence of large-scale randomized controlled trial data. And so uh, in comes Reprieve. And so Reprieve was, was just starting at that point, um, and now we have results. And so um, this is uh, going to be uh, going to play a major role in, in our, our, our primary prevention for people with HIV. So I'm going to um, walk through um, the reprieve results again. These are study. These are slides from from Steve Grinspoon. Um, so so uh, many thanks to him for providing me with these. Um, so this is the rationale. You know, I don't. I, uh, this first bullet point as far as the risk of cardiovascular disease about a twofold increased risk. Um, and um, we know that this residual immune activation is is probably important. Um, for cardiovascular disease and, and many other comorbidities, actually. And that statins lower LDL cholesterol, um, but also may have other effects on immune activation and inflammation. So patavastatin um, is a moderate intensity. Um, uh, it was chosen in this trial um, because of its lack of interactions with, with other, um, with uh, uh, HIV medications. Um, so we know that of the statins, uh, patavastatin and pravastatin really don't have any interactions um, with, you know, not metabolized by CYP3A4. Um, and it has good LDL and, and anti-inflammatory anti properties. Um, so this is the hypothesis that patavastatin would prevent uh, major atherosclerotic cardiovascular events um, through these effects in people who are at low to moderate risk. And we can talk a little bit about who was enrolled uh, in a second. So here are the, the pleiotropic effects of statins, excuse me, uh, the pleiotropic effects on statins. So in addition to lowering uh, LDL cholesterol, lots of other potential effects of statins, which have been talked about for, for some time now, including anti-inflammatory effects, anti-thrombotic effects, this issue about plaque stabilization, which is, is important. So here's the, the inclusion criteria for Reprieve. So we were a site at Hopkins. I think we 
recruited about 55 or something like that, 55, 60 people. Um, and so people with HIV on stable antiretroviral therapy, um, CD4 cell count greater than, than uh, 100, age between 40 and 70, no history of known atherosclerotic disease. And here are the risk scores. So it got a little complicated here as far as who was eligible. So they're using the pool cohort equation. Um, if your, your LDL was less than, than um, 190, uh, uh, the, the 7.5 or less, um, if you're less than 160, um, you could be between 7.5 and 10 between 130, you know, uh, uh, 10 and uh, 15. And so these are actually from the, the national lipid guidelines rather than the, um, the, the um, uh, uh, scientific statement from AHA uh, uh, and ACC. Um, and then the, the inclusion exclusions were people on statins, gen 5 Brazil, PCSK9 inhibitors, or those people with uh, cirrhosis. Uh, so here's the general schema. So um, people with low or moderate risk, um, randomized. So, so uh, seven, over 7,769 you know, 7, people were randomized. Um, Eileen you know, said at the beginning that this is the largest trial ever to be done in people with HIV. Um, uh, randomized to patavastatin four milligrams or uh, placebo. There were some people um, who were... Um, uh, a subset, actually those ACTG sites, who were in a mechanistic substudy that went over two years um, to look at the impact of statins versus placebo on, um, uh, on coronary atherosclerosis using CT and geography. And so those study that the baseline study has been uh, published for the mechanistic substudy. I think we're going to be seeing those results uh, at Croy um, coming up. I think that abstract was submitted. Um, so um, here's the primary clinical uh, primary endpoint, which is a, a, a MACE, so a combined um, uh, endpoint with these uh, various things that, that are it's composed of. Secondary endpoints you can see down here um, as far as inflammation, immunologic bio and metabolic biomarkers. So um, those data have, uh, haven't been published yet um, regarding the effects on inflammation. Um, and I'll show you some of the, the other secondary endpoints in a second. So this was an international study um, and um, uh, additional sites actually came on board. So it, it, um, it you know, there's, it was very large. Um, the endpoints, you know, the, the initially there, there weren't a lot of endpoints in the study. Um, and so the study was, it was increased um, up to 8,000 from 6,000. New sites came on board um, uh, around the globe. And um, uh, there were, uh, the, the um, time uh, was extended as well. So at the end here, you can see the breakdown. So, um, you, know, rep, you know, pretty good global representation actually. Um, you know, most people um, coming from high income countries, but you can see uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, a uh, fair, you know, decent number of, of, uh, of participants coming from those areas. So um, just to, it might be a little hard to see, but just to give you a flavor of the, um, the study population. So median age 50, the, uh, the um, natal sex breakdown was actually quite, um, you know, for, for a study like this to have 31% female um, is, uh, you know, is, is an achievement. Um, and I think it was, it was right on target with what was expected. Of course, it's always good to have more, but there's really enough, given the size of the population, there's really uh, enough to do um, sex stratified um, uh, studies or uh, investigations on the study population. And that's being led by uh, Mark Elizani and, and, uh, and Sarah Ruby at, at Mass General. Um, you can see the gender identity, you know, most, mostly uh, cisgender, uh, few transgender, but but you know the numbers, absolute numbers are are not all that small. Um, and so um, you know there are specific studies, um, sub studies looking at at uh, um, the transgender folks who participated uh, in the study. You can see um, the race breakdown with um, 
you know, a, 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 a quite a, a, a wide distribution. You can see the Nader CD4 cell count, um, which is quite broad as well. <laughs> you know, um, regarding the um, HIV RNA, you, you need to be on stable antiretroviral therapy, um, but there are some people who were undetectable, and most of those people who were not undetectable had low-level viremia, less than 400. And you can see, importantly, what their baseline pool cohort equation, you know, 10-year risk was, which was 4.5. Um, and you can see the baseline LDL, which was uh, 108. Uh, and just to give you a flav more flavor of, of the cohort, this is, as you might expect, a heavily treatment experienced population with 48% uh, or half of the population um, having 10 plus years of antiretroviral use. <laughs> so um, this was an event-driven trial. Um, and so they, are, they had planned to get up to 288 events, and with that, they were able to detect a hazard ratio in favor of um, pitavastatin of, of 0.7. Um, and um, the, there's a DSMB uh, that was convened in, in March, um, and it really wasn't known which way this was going to go. And I, I, I went running with Steve at, in Seattle, at, uh, you know, in, in February at Croy, and this was the next month, and we, and we knew it was coming the next month, and really he had no idea how it was going to go. It could have just as easily closed for, um, for futility. But indeed, it was closed. Um, the study was closed for efficacy, <laughs> and I'll show you those uh, these results. At the time of closure, most people were had been on study for uh, five to six years, um, and uh, you can see there are some, you know, very few that were that were sort of uh, earlier on, and some who were enrolled early, you know, went all, all the way out to eight years. <laughs> here are the primary results. The primary outcome here with uh, MACE. Um, what you can see there was a 34, 35% risk reduction um, in, um, in uh, events uh, in patavastatin versus placebo. Said the secondary endpoint of, of first MACE uh, or death, overall death, there was a 21% uh, uh, risk reduction uh, in patavastatin versus placebo. And you can see this is a primary prevention trial, and you can see that the absolute incidence is, is low, and this is a primary preven uh, prevention trial. And we'll be talking uh, in a second about the number needed to treat and, and um, you know, how this, uh, um, you know, this could be applied to, to populations. So additional findings, um, the, the follow-up was quite good, actually, um, and adherence was good. Um, the uh, adverse uh, event-related discontinuation was low. Um, there was concern, of course, with, um, with drop-ins, so um, statin drop-ins or dropping, dropping out. You know, all these analyses are in intention to treat, but it actually wasn't as, as much as was anticipated. Um, and the events, you know, the COVID, of course, happened in the middle of this. Um, and one MACE, a, a stroke event, was related to COVID. So um, here, I won't belabor this, but this is basically looking at these um, primary endpoints and the MACE components um, that go into them. And you can see all these individual components of MACE at the bottom part of, of the slide. Um, so similar, you know, effects, some, um, you know, quite rare, say the um, first peripheral arterial ischemia, that confidence bar is super wide, and you can see the few number of events is a five out of a total of, you know, seven, oh, you know, 7,700 people. Um, so very rare uh, events. Um, and this, you know, uh, were sensitivity analyses with additional adjustments. Um, so adjusting first for um, the pool cohort equation, the uh, ASCVD risk score for multiple factors. You can see those uh, down in, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the bottom of the slide, but really the main is, results are very robust to these uh, additional uh, adjustment factors. So this is um, you know, a little tough to see, lots going on on in these subgroup slides, but I think really um, useful to think about. <laughs> um, so you know, answering the question, does the effect of patavastatin differ by different population? Is there effect modification really? And so here you, at the top, you see the overall effect of this 35% uh, uh, reduction. 
So the first thing that's that's really pretty interesting is that, you know, overall, I should say, there weren't super, you know, big, big effect modification. There weren't big subgroups that were different than others. You know, this one is actually pretty interesting. So um, the biggest population was is in this five to 10% group on the pooled cohort equation. That's where you saw, you know, it's a, by far the biggest group. Um, but in the lower group, the 2.5 to less than five, it's the, the picture is a little bit different and that's sort of interesting. Um, and I actually haven't talked to, to Steve or any of the, the reprieve team about that. Um, but it is, it is interesting because we do have a lot of patients who are in this group and, and what, do we, what do we do for them? Is this just a statistical vagary, which can happen sometimes with these subgroup analyses or is there something that's really going on there? Um, a few other things. One um, is as far as natal sex, really no difference in uh, men versus women, which is, which is important. No difference by age, but older people seem to have a, a, a bigger uh, benefit. No real difference by, by race or by smoking status, maybe hypertension. Um, you know, so it looks like people who, who um, don't have hypertension are a little bit more likely to benefit. Why that is, is unclear. No difference by, by CD4 cell count. This um, HIV RNA, whether or not they're undetectable, um, is uh, you, uh, no, no real difference there. What you do notice, if you look at the numbers, the actual incident rates, as you might expect, that that group of people who, you know, 368 uh, people, uh, folks who are not uh, undetectable, you know, the rate the rate is 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 quite is is higher in that group um, compared to the people who are are uh, um, undetectable. Um, no difference really by NADR CD4 cell count arc duration, et cetera. And no, and importantly, no difference by although the confidence bars are quite wide. Um, no difference um, by uh, by the area um, uh, geographically. So the effects of LDL were relatively uh, with what you expect, but this is a moderate um, uh, strength statin, not a very high powered statin. So the average the, the went down from 108 down to about 80, um, you know, by by month 72. No change um, in the in the placebo group. So about a 30 percent reduction, which is um, you know pretty good and as expected. What's really interesting, though, is that this is the if you put reprieve on this plot that was published in Lancet some years back. So this basically looks at the effect of um, of statins, um, and this here you see the proportional reduction in your in the MACE events um, versus the decrease in LDL cholesterol that was seen in the trial in, in the treatment versus placebo. And as you can imagine, the, the greater the reduction in, in LDL cholesterol versus placebo, the, in general, the, um, uh, the, the bigger of an effect. But what you see here for reprieve is that um, the, it's, it's quite different actually, <laughs> um, where the effect is higher than you would predict Based on the LDL lowering alone, um, and that's sort of interesting. That's you know, is this does this have to do with some of these the, the pleiotropic effects of statins that that I was talking about earlier? Uh, so that you know, that that's something that is obviously is being explored further on the safety side of things. No unanticipated safety concerns. <laughs> um, there, uh, the serious advents adverse events were similar in the groups actually very relatively few um, severe muscle related uh, symptoms. Um, if you look overall, there was a, a higher prevalence of some of, of you know, moderate muscle related symptoms, but overall pretty low. There was, I'll show you the diabetes data in a second, but there was more uh, diabetes um, in the, the patavastatin group versus placebo and no um, grade three on, on ALT or, or rhabdomyolysis was seen in, uh, in, in uh, patavastatin versus placebo. Here are the diabetes rates. Um, and here's the background in the background this is in the US population. So these are CDC data, you know, this is an international study. So you have to wonder, okay, was this comparable? But here you see the difference in um, the rates in patavastatin versus placebo 
and the um, with the increased relative risk, 34% higher in pitavastatin uh, versus placebo. But you know the the issue, of course, and in, in, while there is a risk, and we know this from other studies, say Jupiter, for example, there is a risk of statins on um, on diabetes risk, but statins work in people with diabetes um, uh, uh, and people without diabetes. And so you can see that um, of the people who had diabetes, you can see uh, four events in Tavistan group, eight in the placebo group. And so this is um, some, it's sort of a work in progress. So this is the, the algorithm, basically what I showed you uh, before from the, um, the, gu the 2019 guidelines. So the question is where do, based on reprieve, um, where, what, how should the guidelines uh, change? Um, and so that's something that, that um, is being actively discussed now. And, and I would suspect that there'll be guidance in the next six months um, uh, on that topic. So one issue that comes up is of course, well, this is, was a patavistatin study. Is this true? Uh, can, the, can the results be extrapolated to other statins? And so I have a patient, lots of patients on atorvastatin, lots of papers, patients on rosuvastatin. Um, what, what, what about, you know, should I change people to patavastatin? You know, one issue is the cost, but patavastatin is, co is coming off patent uh, later this year. Um, but, you know, should we be changing to patavastatin? You know, I, my general feeling, and this is my own personal feeling, is probably not. You know, I think that, that both the torvastatin and res resuvastatin also have, um, have the same pleiotropic effects as, as uh, patavastatin. So I would keep people on. And you can see here, this the table here is stratified by the spectrum. You hear your moderate intensity, patavastatin two to four, with atorvastatin and resuvastatin being uh, uh, higher intensities. Um, and this sort of this is the statin interaction table that I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with um, regarding its metabolism metabolized by by CYP three A four and um, important interactions with people on, on CYP3, potent CYP3A4 inhibitors like cobacistat and ritonavir. So this gets into this number, uh, the number needed to treat, um, which is important, an important consideration. And so um, the, the graph on the, the left looks at, you know, as you would expect, people at a higher baseline CD, CVD risk score are more likely to have an event. Um, so that's not surprising. So this is the overall number needed to treat. So 106, um, uh, which is um, you know a, a pretty good number needed to treat you know, for with a relatively low risk uh, kind of intervention. Um, there is some variability, of course. So people um, who are at higher baseline risk. Um, their number of needed to treat is smaller. So it, it makes more sense to treat those. So, you know, so you can see going from if your um, baseline ASCV, ASCVD risk score is greater than 10, you have, need 35 people to prevent uh, one event, five to 10, 53, and then it jumps up down to 159 and 199. So I think the challenge for, um, you know, how when we think about how um, these results may impact the care of people with HIV. I think it's, in my opinion, the no-brainer for people in the in greater than five percent, um, based on the the current you know pool cohort equation. But here, there's a um, you know there's there's a question, um, and this 2.5 to to five, and certainly the, the less than 2.5. And so this is where you know we're balancing risks and benefits, trying to really understand the risk in that in that um, in the very low, lower than five percent uh, group. So implications. Um, so uh, statin therapy should be considered even at those with low to moderate um, predicted traditional risk, and how low should you go um, is is a big question. Um, you know, at what at what um, ASAVD risk score should you start statin? Should it be five percent? Should it be two point five percent? So unclear. Um, and, you know, of course, the decision should be individualized. Um, you know, this is very good data, as best, as good as we have for trying to, to make this decision. And there will be, you know, multiple sub-analyses coming out from this to help us uh, in that regard. So, um, 
the, as a conclusion, there, um, you know, I, HIV is considered a, a risk equivalent or a risk enhancer for cardiovascular disease. This is really the first study that looked at events. Um, other studies have looked at LDL lowering or other, you know, cardiovascular surrogates. Um, this one um, really uh, is the only one to look at events. Um, so the people with low to moderate risk um, and normal LDL, uh, it, can, you could prevent NACE by giving them uh, patavastatin. And this is the expanding treatment guidelines, which is uh, in flux. And so the next steps here are looking, you know, a bunch of different manuscripts, I think we'll see a bunch of CROI, um, looking at global burden of disease, the disease region, looking at um, you know, effects in specific groups. Um, the, as I mentioned, there's a mechanistic sub-study looking at the effects of, of um, uh, patavastatin versus placebo on, uh, on coronary plaque using CT angiography. Um, the lots of uh, other biomarker studies looking at impacts of, of, of uh, inflammatory markers, et cetera. Um, looking for uh, statins on non-CVD events, um, so particularly uh, HIV-related and, and cancer, um, as there, there's been some preliminary data in the general population showing a potential benefit, say, on cancer outcomes. A assessing the accuracy of the pool cohort equation, you know, which I showed you earlier from the partners, but this is a, a you know, quite a nice database uh, in which to look at this. <laughs> so I'm going to end here and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Todd. Um, this is Richard. If anybody has, um, I can start off, but if anybody has any questions, either speak up or, or raise your hand uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the chat. Uh, Todd, I, I think you addressed one of the questions actually that came to my mind uh, first and foremost, which is the availability of patavastatin, uh, which uh, uh, when it comes off patent, it'll probably be more available, but at the moment it's actually harder to get yep. uh, than atorvastatin and, and resuvastatin. And as you've already pointed out, a lot of our patients are already on one of those uh, two drugs. I, I guess it's hard to know for sure in this clinical trial, but you, you expressed your opinion that probably if you kept them on resuvastatin or even maybe started that, that would be perfectly Good. Yeah, I mean, and, and yeah, so, and particularly, you know, one specifically is, you know, now that the trial is over for our 50 some odd people who are on the study, you know, what should they be switched to? You know, should we be giving them patavastatin or should we, you know, be giving them, you know, any statin? Um, and probably, um, you know, my feeling would be any statin. Um, you know, by the book, it would be patavastatin. Um, but yeah, so you're, you're, um, you know, I think the the question of of generalizability is one that we'll never we'll never really know the answer to. Um, but there's not reason to suspect that um, that you know atorva or resuva would be any different. Other questions? I see. Uh, so Greg was asking, people are on the trial for a long time. Yeah, so that was, <laughs> was very different than all than a lot of ACTG trials that we do, actually. So that was a, a, a challenge. Uh, wondering if this being a double-blind study led to fewer people starting a statin in the control group than would have been the case in natural history, potentially increasing events in the control arm. Um, that's possible. I mean, the the um, you know when when this study was powered, they looked at and they thought about what the event rate based on previous data, what the event rate was going to be in the placebo group, um, and it actually was quite a bit lower than they had anticipated. Um, and so um, it, that sort of indirectly gets gets at, at your question, but I think you know we we would never know. Um, you know, as far as people who would have been in a stat on a statin, um, you could potentially look at changing risk over time, I guess, in the placebo group to to um, try to address that question. But you, you never know exactly what what the thresholds are. And of course, during this time, you know, of the of the five to eight years of the study, um, there was, you know, increasing recognition of cardiovascular disease being being a major 
uh, risk factor in uh, a, a, a major um, uh, cause of morbidity and mortality in people with HIV. So, um, you know, there, there could have been more people who, who would have been treated, tough to say. Um, given that epitaphstatin is moderate intensity, would there be reason? Yeah, so um, could a Torva or Suva might even have a greater effect? It could be, you know. Um, you know, and, and the question, the other question is how much of it is, is um, LDL lowering versus these pleiotropic effects of statins? And of course, um, uh, um, Resuva and Atorva also have these, the, the same kind of pleiotropic effects. And, and, you know, as you all know, um, Jupiter, which was the, the, um, the study in, in people without HIV, but who had a high uh, CRP, so were inflamed, um, uh, had a, a similar, you know, a, a similar uh, effect. Um, I think the fact that Repreve had, had more event reduction than predicted, blah, 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 which I've seen in Jupiter, right, exactly. Even more credence to your suggestion, right, exactly. So, yeah, so, um, uh, you know, this is total speculation, um, but, but, you know, that's, that's sort of the idea behind it. And we'll see, you know, to the extent that we can measure inflammation by the stuff that we can pull off of, you know, people's blood, measuring people's blood, you know, I, I you know, we'll, we'll get a better window into that um, with some of the analyses that are coming down the pike. Other questions? So yeah, one, you know, I saw a patient yesterday with um, perinatal uh, history of perinatal infection, 32, a female, you know, referred to me for, for lipodystrophy. And she had just seen her, she had a strong family history. Father also had, um, had HIV, um, died at age 49 of an MI, and she had pretty normal lipid panel. And so the question, in addition to, you know, addressing her lipodystrophy concerns, the question was, should this 32-year-old also be started on Tavistat. And so I went, you know, dutifully went into the, the pooled cohort equation and, you know, had to remind myself that the pooled cohort equation starts at age 40. So she wasn't even on the pooled cohort equation. And so um, I, if I gave her, if I made her the lowest, which was age 40, um, you know, her risk based on risk factors was like 0.8. And so, you know, now we're talking in the number needed to treat based on reprieve um, would be somewhere in the 200 range. Um, and so that, you know, what about, you know, the, the person that I presented at the, in, earlier in the talk, you know, there's no question, you know, you, you would have put him on a statin. But for this, this woman, you know, I'm not so sure, you know, and, and you have to worry about the, the you know, uh, concerns if, if she were to, to have children, the, the, um, the, uh, the effects on, on the developing baby, you know, uh, statins are category X. So, you know, we, we really have to, um, tr you know, instead of, you know, be, be uh, cautious and judicious, I think, about applying these results to a, a broad, a very broad population. Todd, Todd, do you think that uh, you have sufficient numbers and data in that in that outlier group uh, at not the lowest risk, but but still a risk between two and a half five percent, which seemed to go the wrong direction yeah, compared yeah. to everything else? The numbers are going to be there to try to understand that better. Granted, the ninety five percent confidence limits overlapped, yeah, so it could very well be a statistical artifact, so to speak, but, uh, but, but I'm just curious. You, Yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. I, do I, I'd be, be interested to hear, you know, how much they're going to go after. I mean, it's, I think it's a really important question because we do have a lot of people in that very, you know, very right. risk group um, and trying to understand, um, you know, the impact of, of, of patatostatin in particular on that group, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be really important. Yeah, I think that, you know, once you <laughs> to do a sub sub analysis makes it trippy, tricky, tricky. Uh, sure. you know, these, these were the these were the, um, you know, pre specified uh, endpoint pre specified, um, you know, uh, um, subgroup analyses. 
but you know, ideally you and you could do this as a hypothesis generating kind of thing to take that group and try to understand who benefited and who didn't, you know, trying to characterize that group a little bit better. Um, you know, I think it's probably worth exploring, but I don't think we're going to get any definitive data from it. It, it does make you want to go back to say NA Cord and look at that population um, uh, in a very in a large, very large group. Uh, and try to understand their their uh, you know, trajectories as, as far as cardiovascular disease. Or in other big cohorts uh, where those data exist. Like, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, like in Gene Triant's cohort up in, up in, uh, yep. yeah. uh, up in Massachusetts. Yep. Uh, does Bartlett Pharmacy stock have a statin? I, no, most community pharmacies don't. I don't know the answer to that. Joyce, do you know, or I'm, I'm not sure, I can't tell if any of our pharmacists are on, on the call. But to have a statin, mainly because it's on patent and expensive, actually is not, you, you've got to jump through hoops to get it. Uh, but but Joyce, what about our pharmacy? Yeah, I'm honestly, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I know I've, I always order it, <laughs> it's always what I order. Um, trying to remember if it's um been approved for any of my patients. Usually, it's the insurance restriction that's the issue. I I I can I can check. Let me see if I can get an answer in the next twelve minutes. Yeah, all all of our um the insurers I'm aware of actually don't. It, it's it's not a, well. It can be approved, but you have to. It, it's it, it's. Unlike a torvastatin and a suvastatin, which of course are 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 both generic, uh, it's it's not listed on something that you can easily get, and so you have to ask uh, for permission, and you have to actually show that they've that that they failed the other ones. But that that may change. Uh, it, so you you mentioned how it comes off patent, yeah, uh, later this year. So that very well may change and within six months. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how this impacts care around the world because all healthcare systems are quite different as far as availability goes um, and what statins are available in various settings is important you know, in the US and around the world. Are there any other uh, questions or comments from uh, from anyone else? Great. Well, feel free to reach out if um, you have any uh, additional questions, comments, et cetera. I, I do think we're going to be seeing Stephanie Croy. I was the co-chair of a study um, looking at the impact of um, uh, patavastatin on physical function measurements. Um, and, you know, so with potential muscle effects of statins or potential benefits of decreasing inflammation on muscle function, we looked at that uh, in a sub-study of, of um, of people in in um, in, in reprieve. Um, well, one question that did cross my mind that that um, and maybe you addressed it in your slides, but I don't recall that you did. This study was obviously done in the era where we're using integrase strand inhibitors hmm. and even a lot of TAF, I, I assumed, uh, which have been shown to potentially, I guess, have weight effects. Um, all, although I realize a lot of the data maybe suggests that our older drugs had weight loss effects <laughs> and, and the weight gain uh, 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 effects really aren't as much. But I'm just curious, was there any look at not only in regard to duration of our use, I remember that was on one of the table, but particular art drugs that people were on? Yeah, yeah. Um... And so I, I rushed through that, and this was only the baseline regimen. And let me just see if I can uh, share real quick. Um, uh, blah, 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 share screen. Um, okay, screen you're sharing. Remember, one of the tables had duration of art, which really yeah. is different. So let me. Uh, what happened? Oh, there we go. And it, it might have had the actual regimens, and I just missed it. Yeah, it wasn't. Um, uh, there we go. Um, okay. Yeah, so I, the, I, I focused on that. The, the next thing is about um, 
art regimen and you know very they so you can see the number of in sea containing regimens and mind you this is baseline so in the US so high income countries you know where half of the people came from um, the insties were you know back in 2018 um, some alva some you know dalitegravir raltegravir um, but you can see that it was uh, 26%. Most people, uh, so with 24% on uh, NNRTIs, so presumably mostly um, afavirins at that point, uh, although there might've been some milpivirine. So, um, and you can see there's some variation in the various uh, settings, but yeah, I think that, that there's gonna be some um, increased in uh, scrutiny on well, what happened during this five-year period right. where any retrovirals were changing um, you know both for you know switching on to integrase inhibitors um, switching uh, from TDF to TAF switching off of back of the air you know I think those are all you know critical questions okay so as you've already said a lot more to come yep 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 yeah, so this is Laura. So I put something in the chat, but I actually looked it up. So USPST, US Preventive Services Task Force does list statins. And is there ever a time where they talk about specific like subgroups or anything? I'm just wondering if there'd be a way of making sure that our patients might have access to the copays and deductibles. Mm. To get on the task force record. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I know that, that you know, specific for the, the ACCHA recommendations, but the, the um, preventative task force, you know, is sometimes different than the specific, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, expert group um, analyses. So, I mean, yeah, I'm not sure if this is going to, um, you know, if that's going to be considered, uh, you know, the, the HIV subgroup is going to be considered in um, in the next iteration of those uh, recommendations from USP, U, USPSDF. Yeah, I think that you, I think whenever they, they're reconsidering things, they do look for public comment and things. It might, might just be something that the ACTG investigators think about because yeah. it would, this is a very different group than what they would ever recommend for other, for statins generally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, in my opinion, you know, going down to 5% makes a lot of sense in this, in this group. Um, and I think that's what, what, you know, that's, that's, I think that's the, the finding that you can really, you know, hang your hat on. Um, uh, but below that, you know, I think there's a question. Any uh, final questions? Um, I heard from the Bartlett Pharmacy. We do carry pitavastatin, but as mentioned, only a small number of insurance companies will actually cover it for patients, but it, it is in the pharmacy. Thank you, Joyce. The, the other thing I'll mention um, regarding treatment is, um, you know, this whole, you know, this with the new relatively new guidelines, um, you know, as far as uh, titration of statin. You know, do you start immediately on, um, you know, a high dose statin and then back down if there are some side effects or do you titrate up? Um, and, you know, that was, um, you know, one change in, in practice that, you know, was really pushed by, by the cardiologist because of there's this dose escalation inertia that you get. Um, people, they might start on a low dose statin, but they stay, people stay on a low dose statin. So the, the recommendation was, oh, just put people on, you know, the, their, you know, the, the full dose the, um, and, um, and then back down if there's, if there's an issue. Um, frankly, I still start low and, and not super low, but start at a decent dose and, and build my way up. Um, you know, I, I, I just think that I'm more comfortable with that strategy, but I just wanted to put that out there. And that's what, what um, uh, was put in the, in the, the uh, HIV guidelines that um, you know, Wendy Post was a part of. And I think that, that makes a lot of sense. Well, Todd, um, I echo Joyce's uh, comment in the chat. Thank you. It was uh, great work, and I think it was great. We had about 60 of our uh, patients that were able to be uh, in the study and uh, really appreciate all you do, uh, not just this study, but everything else that you do in regard to uh, uh, advising us and, uh, 
and helping us care for our patients. Uh, so uh, thank you a lot for this, uh, for this presentation and for everything. Sure thing, my pleasure. Thanks, congratulations on the great work. Thanks.